The following program is sponsored by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. Thank you for joining us today on Kingdom Connection. It's my prayer that God will use something specific in this broadcast today to really speak directly to your spirit. I say that with confidence because I know God still speaks to us and it's really our desire here that you will open your heart and hear a now word of what God is saying to you. We're so grateful to have you with us on Kingdom Connection today. Let's go right into the service. I want to talk to you about a story in 2 Samuel 15 that is very re relevant to our times, and you'll see in a moment. Verse 14, so David said to his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Notice what his thinking is about. Strike the city with the edge, completely destroy the city. And the king's servant said to the king, we're your servants and we're ready to do whatever the Lord, the king commands. Then I want to skip over to verse 23. And when all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people crossed over, the king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron. All the people crossed over by the way of the wilderness. And there was Zadok also and the Levites with him bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God and Abathar went up into the people had finished crossing over the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the ark back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, thus I have no delight in you, here I am. Let him do with me as seems good to him. Verse 14 is particularly what I'm focusing in on. He says, we need to make haste and depart. The latter part of that verse, lest he strike the city with the edge of the sword. I want to talk to you about choosing not to fight. Choosing not to fight. Because that's exactly what was taking place in this text. David was king of Israel. Absalom, his own son. Everybody say, it's family. His own son is... decided to attack and overtake and rebel and overtake his father's kingdom, the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And in that moment, David has to make a decision. And the Bible said, he said to his servants, we're going to leave, we're going to, we're going to walk out of here, we're going to get out of here. And they said, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. If you want to fight, we'll fight. If you want to give it up, we'll give it up. You just tell us what to do. And he said, we need to leave lest he smite the city with the edge of the sword. I want to clearly state that I believe that God knows exactly what he's doing in the world today. I believe in the sovereignty of God just like David. David said, it's his kingdom. And if he wants me to have it, I'll have it. If he doesn't want me to have it, I don't want it. And he said, we're going to leave because what's important is the city of Zion, a picture of the church, a picture of the kingdom. What's important is not what I want or what you want, but look at the big picture, it's the kingdom. And he said that he wants to destroy the city I don't want innocent bystanders to be destroyed. I don't want blood in the streets. When you understand that God is sovereign, that men come and go, but God is sovereign, when you understand that He makes no mistakes, 
The Bible said he is righteous in all of his ways. In all of his ways, he's right. Whether you understand it or not, the Bible said in Romans that the carnal mind cannot discern the things of the Spirit, that if all you do is made up your mind how God must act and what He must do and how He must do it, you will never understand that God's ways are not your ways, God's thoughts are not your thoughts, and we need to take solace in the fact that God is sovereign and completely in control in our world and in our nation and in our life. David loved God, and because he loved God, he loved everything that God loved. If you don't love God first, you don't love the things you're supposed to love, the people of God, your brothers and your sisters, the church, the kingdom, the word, the worship of God's house. Fall in love with God. That's what David did. The thing that impresses me about David, two things greatly impress me about David. Number one, he never worshipped idols. He made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of bad things, but he never worshipped any other God. He said, there's one God, and I know who he is, and I'll never worship even when I fail and I fall. I'm coming back to that God. And he never worshipped an idol. The second thing that impresses me about David is he refused to ever raise his sword against his own brothers and sisters and flesh and blood. When I think about David, I think about the fact that he's a warrior. So this couldn't have been easy for him to just walk away from the throne room and walk away from being king. It couldn't have been easy. It had to be everything instinctively inside of him. He was a fighter. He said in 1 Samuel 17, I fought a bear. I fought a lion on another occasion. And I just want to teach this for a minute. The bear and the lion were a threat to his family welfare because he was guarding the sheep and that was the family business and the lion came to hurt the family welfare and the bear came to, to, to take away the family welfare. And he fought the bear and the lion and slew them. And then there came a time in the same chapter when he fought Goliath. And Goliath was a war that he fought for the national warfare of the nation and the welfare of the nation. We're so worried about the nation, but we're losing the battle against the lion and the bear in our own home. We have to remind ourselves that it's not the White House that decides how much God I'm going to have in my life. It is what's going on in my house. And if I'm not fighting the bear and the lion in my own house, how can I dare think that we're going to defeat the Goliath on a national level? He was a warrior. He fought bears and lions and giants. It was his instinct. He was surrounded with trained killers. God even said, he's such a bloody man, I won't let him build my temple. He knew how to fight. He had fought many armies. He had fought the bravest and strongest and mightiest armies in the world and defeated them hands down. But now there comes a time when against all instinct, David is moved on by the Spirit of the Lord, and he says, this time I choose not to fight. This time I choose to advocate the throne, and I choose to go with what God is telling me to do, and I don't feel like I'm supposed to fight this time. I feel like that, that there will be innocent bystanders. He will strike the city with a sword, and there will be many, 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 many blood in the streets. A civil war will happen, so I'm going to put it in the hands of God. He was more concerned about the preservation and health of the city of Jerusalem, that Jerusalem at all costs must stay intact. Too much good is coming out of that. Salvation is going to come out of that city. Prophecies are going to be fulfilled out of that city. Jesus is going to rule and reign one day from that city. I can't just let that city be destroyed because my ego is hurt. David could have said, I could win this fight. He could have let his lust for revenge cause him to bring greater division than Israel had ever faced. David was not one to run from the fight. 
But he was doing what he was doing to preserve the city. Every now and then we have to come to a place that we realize that there's something more important than our personal feelings or more important than our personal agendas. This is not about me. And quite frankly, this is not about you. He died on a cross for you and for me. He shed his blood. And the last thing we ought to be doing in this critical hour the last thing that we ought to be doing in church is picking up our swords and using them on each other. When the world needs a church like it's never needed one before. The truth is, we all have an agenda. And we need to humble ourselves. I've watched friendships of many years between people suffer injury because of disagreements in politics. Shame on us all. I can absolutely disagree with you and not agree with anything in the world that you agree in on politics and vice versa with me. And that should have nothing to do with my love, my concern, my compassion, my genuine pure heart of love and concern for you as my brother and my sister. David said, if I don't leave, he will smite the city with the edge of a sword. And I'm afraid that some of us have been using the sword against our own brothers and sisters. Simon Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember that story? And the Bible said the high priest came. Somebody who was religious and Simon Peter had pride that he was so religious. And when they came to arrest Jesus, he took his sword and he swung. And he wasn't swinging and aiming for the ear. He was aiming for the head. He missed and just got the ear. And Jesus reached down and picked the ear up and put it back on supernaturally. And then he rebuked Peter and he said, you have the right doctrine, but the wrong spirit. It's possible to have the right doctrine and have the wrong spirit. And he said, put your sword away, Simon Peter, for if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. I, I'm, I'm just going to preach right here. I feel like the Lord is speaking. And he's saying to the body of Christ, put your sword in the sheave. You're not supposed to be attacking one another and unfollowing one another and disconnecting and I'll go to my camp and you go to your camp. I refuse that. I, refu I choose not to fight. I choose to love. By Listen, there, love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself and you fulfill all the law. You know what he was saying when he said, put your sword away? You ought not to be cutting up somebody you disagree with. And I've never, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't put a shank in anybody. But boy, you've been cutting on, online. <laughs> Unfollow. <laughs> Unfollow. People you've known for years. People you've worshipped with for years. telling you the Lord messed me up with this one right here. Don't you forget this line right here. This story teaches us when he said put your sword away. It teaches us that there are some battles that don't take a sword to win. It takes a crucifixion. Sometimes you don't win by fighting and cutting everybody. Sometimes you God allows you to go through a crucifixion and you die to your pride and you die to your ego and you die to your opinion and your will and your way. The thing that blessed me about this story more than anything else is 
as David was leaving on his own because it was the best for, for the city that he loved, the church that he loved. You can leave, but notice the spirit in which he leaves. Zadok and the Levites brought the Ark of the Covenant. After all, he was the man who, you remember, he's the one who brought it back to the church. He's the man who trained musicians and, and, and singers to get around. He's the one that rolled the, the, the tent up and, and said, everybody come. He's the one that built a magnificent house of worship. And it was all about the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. And so they just assumed, well, if he's leaving, then pick up the glory. The glory is leaving the church with him. And when your spirit is, if I leave, then bless God, that place can go to hell. Ah, God ain't there. God, that place blessed you. That place... When your spirit is, when I leave, I want the glory to leave. I want the anointing to leave. I want the presence to leave. I hope the worship falls to pieces. I hope the church goes under. Number one, it ain't going to never go under because it's built on the rock. But, but here's the thing. I have no agenda except I'm preaching the truth right now. And I hear the Lord saying, preach it. I want to get some little attitudes and just tweak them and make them just like me instead of just like somebody else. Because when you leave and you want something to be destroyed and watch David's spirit, no bitterness, no bitterness. Watch him. He could have said, yeah, bring the Ark of the Covenant because wherever that box goes, that God box, victory goes, prosperity goes, it's, it's leaving. He said, no, send it back. And even if I can't go there for a while, I'll just say this to God. God... If you favor me, you'll let me go back. And if you don't, listen to this man. This is the real David. He could have fought and won, but he's got such a spirit of humility. Of, of, there is a cause that is greater than me, and he was the king. His ego was in check. And he says, but God, if... If you don't favor me and I don't go back, my life is in your hands. In other words, so many words, not my will, but thine be done. I don't understand everything, but I know you're sovereign and I love you. And the Bible said he sent the Ark of the Covenant back. What kind of spirit do you have? Is there not a cause? I'm almost done. But Absalom had an ambition for the throne. David was anointed for the throne. And you know the story, don't you? Ambition will always be conquered by the anointing. There's a lot of people who have unsanctified ambition in the church. They want a position so bad and they don't care who they kill and who they slay and how bad they hurt the church. If they don't get it, I'm blessed God get the Ark of the Covenant. Where's my purse? I'm out of here. <laughs> Can we get some mature believers who understand there's something a little bit bigger going on around here than my ego? Souls are being saved. Lives are being changed. The anointing always supersedes ambition. You know why I believe David could leave? Because when God's anointed you for something and somebody ambitious is trying to take it from you, he knew. He's not anointed for that. Nobody is going to get what God's anointing me to do. I may go through a setback. I may not be in that position for a while, but if I'll humble myself and keep the right spirit, God will guide my life where, right where I'm anointed to be. You know what happened? A few days later, he was out riding on a horse or a donkey, and his hair got, this ambitious man, his hair got caught in a tree, 
and he was hanging by the tree and it just so happened that Joab, the chief army commander and assassin of King David came up on him and he said target practice and took three darts and shot him while he was hanging by his hair from a tree and David comes back. Now he's going right back. He could have fought and left the city devastated and untold damage. But now in God's time, things we fight over that if we trust God I'm not saying you don't take a stand I'm not saying you don't stand up I'm, but there comes a time where it becomes more negative and detrimental to keep fighting so let me bring it right home I'm almost done I promise but I got to finish with this the Lord spoke to my heart and he said just like just like David didn't want that holy city Jerusalem to be smitten with a sword tell families it's time to choose not to fight be careful how you treat your wife be careful how you treat your husband be careful how you treat your children be careful you may be right you may be right on the issue but there has to come a moment if you want peace and you don't want innocent bystanders like grandchildren and children husbands, wives, moms, dad, teenagers, there comes a time when you have to choose not to fight. Thank you so much for being with us today on Kingdom Connection. It's because of you we're on television right now. Our number one goal is to reach people with the gospel, to find the hurting, the broken, those that feel like they don't matter and don't count, and call them into a real loving relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're hurting today and you're watching right now and you want to give your life to Jesus, why don't you just repeat this prayer after me? Lord Jesus, just say those words. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You died and shed your blood to forgive me and rose again to live through me. And I give you my life. Give me your peace. Give me your help. Give me your, your purpose for my life. Help my family. Help me. Direct me. Guide me through this time. In Jesus' name, I don't want to be alone anymore. Amen and amen. I really want you to know a miracle just happened. Our team has prepared a special kit designed for your new walk with the Lord. We really want to help you. We pray that this 21-day devotional will bless you and guide you. Whatever season of life that you may be in, you'll sense the presence, the peace, and the goodness of God. For decades, I've set the beginning of the year for prayer and fasting. 
I know we're approaching Christmas and the holidays. We've come through so much with the election and it's feast time again. Hopefully we'll be able to get together with our families and have big Christmas celebrations. But this January, in just a few short weeks, we'll be coming together as a ministry to set aside the first of the year and seek God in fasting and in prayer. For 21 days, we will seek the face of the Lord. Our team has put together some unique resources to help you plan and prepare and to build your faith for a successful fast. You can do it. And please know that your gift of support to this ministry helps us keep preaching the message of Jesus Christ all around the world in over 200 nations all over the world. We, you keep it going. You make it happen when you give. That's our primary reason for being here. Everything else is just that we do. And we do a lot of missions and we do a lot of support stuff. But the primary reason we're here is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to 200 nations through this broadcast and create inspirational resources to use and bless people's lives and tell them more about Jesus. Thank you. Please help us end strong this year. Give an unusual gift. We need your support to do what God has called us to do. Thank you. Are you ready to transform your life? Now you can experience Jensen Franklin's dynamic teaching on fasting in his New York Times best-selling book, Fasting. You'll receive the keys to encountering the countless rewards and blessings of fasting that open the door to a deeper, more intimate relationship with God. Everything you need to access the power of biblical fasting is found in the 2020 Fasting Kit, including the types of fasts in the Bible, the secret to a successful fast, choosing the right fast for you, the connection between fasting and prayer, how to begin and end your fast, the essential components of a successful fast, what to expect physically, mentally, and spiritually, with your generous gift of $1,000 or more this month, you'll not only help us preach the gospel through the broadcast to over 200 nations globally, but help us go above and beyond to help our partners in Israel. You can request the 2020 Limited Edition Fasting Kit, plus this lovely replica of the type of oil lamp commonly used in Jesus' day. We'll also include this specially created blanket inscribed with the Numbers Chapter 6 blessing and our special edition Legacy Bible with over 300,000 words of commentary, including highlights from Jensen Franklin's fasting teachings. Or with your best gift of $50 or more, you can receive Jensen Franklin's fasting kit and get ready for God's power to break through in your life. Fasting is a tremendous weapon and a source of power in the life of every believer. Experience it today. Sharice and I want to invite you to join us on our Holy Land tour. It's an amazing trip, unlike anything you've ever experienced. And we'll be on the trip. We get on the buses. Our family will be on there. And I promise you, it will change your life. You've been thinking about it. You've been praying about it. This is the year to go. God's going to open your eyes to things you've never seen and experienced before in the Holy Land. Get signed up today. This program has been sponsored by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. We hope you've enjoyed this teaching by Jensen Franklin and thank you for your continued support of this ministry. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. 